the approach to preaching, teaching, writing, and evangelism that most of us saw modeled and consequently inherited is perfectly designed for a culture that no longer exists. The Bible says does not carry the weight that it once did. But fortunately, first century church leaders showed us the way forward. They put all of their eggs in one basket, the Easter basket. They leveraged the event of the resurrection and the time has come for us to do the same. Let's adjust our sails. Let's shift our approach for the sake of the gospel. Your faith doesn't depend on it. My faith doesn't either, but the faith of the next generation just might. The faith of this generation just might as well. So let's make our faith irresistible again. Yeah, I, that's, that was good. I think that was good. I know it's odd to ask a large crowd how you're doing because you're like, am I supposed to answer him? It's like, yeah, that was, that was good. So we are um, we're in a series of messages striving to make the church and the message of Jesus Christ irresistible in the world. Originally, when the first disciples started going out into the world, their passion and their love and their, their commitment to what Jesus had in store for the world changed everything. Basically, people were so caught up by their passion, so caught up in their actions and activities and excitement that they just came along. But what has happened, especially in the last 25 to 30 years, what's happened is the church has institutionalized everything we do, we've systematized everything we do, we've structured everything we do, and we've become very resistible through the process. Yeah, there are lots of people this morning who are doing lots of different things, and statistically what we know is a lot of those things are not church. So this morning, real early this morning, I was at the, the giant grocery store making sure we had grape juice for today for our communion time, and at 7 o'clock this morning I was amazed at how many people were in the grocery store. Now, I'm just thinking to myself, because I'm a positive thinker, I'm thinking all these people are doing their grocery shopping before they go to church. That's what I'm thinking, right? Yeah, and 25 years, 30 years ago, that may not have been funny. That would be, Yeah, well, of course, that's what people are doing. But today, we kind of chuckle at that, and we laugh at that, because the fact of the matter is, most likely, that's not true. There are people who got up this morning who have a soccer tournament today, or um, some kind of game today, or they've got something else to do today, or... You know, they get up Sunday mornings and they think maybe this is a good day to mow the lawn or this is just a good day to relax and because everything else has been so busy in my life. Everything was supposed to be easier when computers came along. If computers were going to make our life so much easier that we were going to have all this free time, right? We're going to have so much free time that everything would be wonderful and we would have all this free time and so we'd get up Sunday morning and we'd be relaxed and comfortable and church would be just, you know, we'd have, it would be easy, not true. Not true. As a matter of fact, I think technology has made life a little bit more chaotic and a lot busier. And so here we are, we're in this situation where we're finding ourselves in a place that has become very resistible to the world. And that's not what God had in mind. It's certainly not what Jesus had in mind when he came about in the world to bring salvation to everyone. So we're going to we're going to work hard because, you see, what the church has primarily done in the world today is it's basically been about 20 years behind the curve and always playing catch-up. And I'd like to be the kind of church that maybe gets out in front of the curve a little bit, gets out in front of our culture just a little bit and strives to lead where people need to be rather than always playing catch-up because that's just exhausting. And many churches have said, you know what, we're not even going to play catch-up anymore. We're not even going to try anymore. We're not even going to work at it anymore. And as much as this breaks my heart, in America alone, we're closing anywhere between three and 4,000 churches every year. And we've been doing so for the last 10 years. We're opening churches at a much slower rate than we're closing, and therefore we're losing the battle in the world while the world continues to increase its population the church continues to decrease the number of places people can go to find the answer so the series that we're doing right now is an effort an attempt for us to try to change and to try to make something different happen as a part of our overall three-year vision that we launched almost 18 months ago 
We launched this message that, that we wanted to be something different. We wanted to be the kind of assembly, the kind of church that says we, we want to be a place where families are supported and uplifted, that the community is strengthened and encouraged, and the message of Jesus is spread throughout the world by believers who are convicted and convinced about the saving power of Jesus Christ. And we've been doing many things over the last year and a half, or a little more than that, uh, trying to change ourselves and trying to make some adjustments that would make the message irresistible again. We've been working in the community diligently, striving to, to make sure people know that Jesus loves them and make sure that Jesus cares about them we, and to let people know that we care. We've been making strategic hires. We've been changing plans. We've been opening ourselves up to new possibilities. We've been discovering the needs in our neighborhood. We even built new classrooms in Sierra Leone to, with, for kids we will most likely never, ever meet, many of us in the room. So why do we do all those things? Why would we bother, right? There are lots of churches that said, we're just going to do what we've always done, and eventually when the money's gone, we'll close the doors. And I'm not willing to do that. And my suspicion is you're not willing to do it either. But we need to make a decision about what we're going to do for the future. And so the better question is not so much why would we do that. The better question we need to start asking is what are we doing next? What are we going to do next? Because on a night 2,000 years ago, one of the disciples got up and left the room. And I don't want to see people get up and leave the room. Because that meant betrayal. It meant that I just can't do this anymore. And what I want to do is start seeing people come into the room. But that moment marked something. 2,000 years ago, that moment when one person left the room marked a difference. Jesus said that the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory and God will be glorified because of him. Jesus is sitting in this upper room in the town of Jerusalem where he's having the Passover meal. His, what would be his last meal with his closest group of disciples, his closest followers. And while he was doing that, one of them got up and left in an effort to sell out the Savior. And the old system of that, that wanted to kill Jesus was about to be finalized. And the new was coming. Now, it was going to take a traumatic event. Jesus was going to need to die for the new to be put into place. But what he says to his disciples is so significant for us today, and I believe we have forgotten the importance of this message. So I want to bring you back to John chapter 13 and just two verses in the segment that you heard read. The two verses are these. So, now I'm giving you a new commandment. I want to stop for just a moment because here's what he's doing in that statement. He's saying, you know those ten commandments you had? I'm giving you a new one. Now, he had already taken the ten commandments and boiled it down to two. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, right? That was the first. And he said the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Some of you could have said that along with me, right? Those, he boils all of the ten down to two. As a matter of fact, he boils 614 of them down to those two. Love God with everything you've got and love others like you love yourself. If you do those two things, it's going to go well with you. It's going to be good with you. You're going to be living out the Ten Commandments. How can you mess up if you do those two things? Love God, love others, right? If you do those two things, it's going to be fine. You're going to answer all the Ten Commandments, all the 614 rules. If you're loving God and you're loving others, then it's going to go well with you. But he says, but there's one more. So, so he takes the Ten, puts them down to two, and he says, now in light of all of that, here's how I want you to live out this new commandment. Love each other. Love each other. Okay, that's not too bad, and we can probably do that. You know, it's not bad. I love you. You love me, right? Uh, it's a Barney song, right? Gosh, I almost went there. Wow, that was a little scary. <laughs> I can't believe I remembered that. But it's. But he says there's more. He says, you know. I, we love each other, right? 
We care about each other, right? But he says, I want you to do something a little bit more than that. I want you to love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. You see, he puts a qualifier. He puts a qualifier into the system, into the co- commandment. And he takes love and now he makes it a verb, an action word. It's your first teaching note today. He's going to take love and take it from an abstract thought process of just, you know, kind of out there somewhere and says, I want you to love each other like I loved you. I want you to do something. As in, and and the words he used are the imperative language. As John is recording this, he's saying, what Jesus is, is saying to each one of us is go and love somebody. You see that person over there? Go love them. Go do something about it. Go make sure that their situation is, is enhanced, that they know that they are loved, that they're cared about, that this is now an action for you. It's no longer just a sentiment. It's no longer just a thought. It's no longer just a, a nice thing to think about. It's something you do. We love because now it's an action. Jesus' command goes beyond just a feeling or it's more than a feeling. We could do a lot of songs about this, right? He was commanding them to do something. There's 20 people in the room who got that. More than a few. Anyway, all right. It's true, right? I mean, the song is correct. Jesus said it first. Go love people. Go do something so that someone knows how much I love them. You see, our complexity is that love is such an emotional mess that we get caught up in helping people know that we love them. Jesus says, no, I want you to let them know I love them. So love them the way I love you. The disciples must have sat at that table for a moment and looked at each other and said, you mean like when you walked out and calmed the seas? You mean like when you lifted Peter when he was sinking? You mean like when you healed people who couldn't see? or were damaged physically or emotionally? You mean like that? Like like the way you loved people was just amazing. I don't know if we can love like that. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you a command. This is not just a good idea. This is how people are going to know about me. This is how the faith is going to become irresistible. If we make our actions into the ones that Jesus would live out into the lives of someone else. Because if you love Jesus, next teaching note, you ready for this? Because if you love Jesus, then you will love like he loved. And I know that's not easy. And I know it comes with all kinds of complexities. I, I, I know. I know it's hard to love people who have damaged and hurt you. I know it's hard to love people who think differently than you, but Jesus loved his Father in heaven. He loved his parents. He loved the outcasts. He loved the sinners. He loved the broken. He loved the sick. He loved the liars. He loved the rich. He loved the poor, especially the poor. He loved to the very last breath in his body. He loved with his life, his body, and his blood. And he loved so much And it was such a radical thought process that they could not allow him to exist. But it didn't stop there. You see, he's talking to his disciples on the night before he is arrested. They're going to take him away. They're going to beat him. They're going to spit on him. They're going to mock him. They're going to make him walk through the town with a cross on his shoulders. They're going to take him up to the hillside just outside of the city of Jerusalem. They're going to lay him down on that cross. And with large nails, they're going to drive him to stick to that cross in such a way that they're going to nail right through his own flesh so that he will hang there in the Jerusalem sun for you and for me. He says, love the way I love. See? That's the way I love, he says. I don't know if they were ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I don't know if you're ready for that. But here's what I know. That's what he did, and that's what he's calling us to do. And the world needs to see that kind of love. And if we're not cautious, we will just institutionalize it and tell people here, either read this book or just come to church. It'll be great. You'll be fine. And the fact of the matter is, it may not be great. It may not be fine. Anybody in this room know Jesus and have a hard life at times? 
Am I talking to the right crowd? It, life gets challenging, life gets difficult. I don't know anybody that walks on a cloud. This is challenging. And if you really want to dive into this challenge, and I, I think part of the reason people don't dive into this challenge is because it is so difficult. And they just don't see anybody doing it. And I think the world needs to see some irresistible believers living in such a way that they cannot resist the faith anymore because they love like he loved. Giving it all away. Surrendering everything you got. He would end up from the cross loving in such a way that he would tell his mother to, that John was now his son, his caretaker. And that John, my mom is now your mom. You need to take care of her now because I'm going to leave and breathe my last. On that same cross, he forgives the people who put him there. Think about that for a moment. Love the way I love. Can you forgive some of the people who have done some damage to you in your life? Can you love the, the way he loves? You see, here's what I believe. He gives us this command thinking we can do this. Jesus believes you can do this. He wouldn't have given us the command if he didn't believe it was, was, was let me say that right. He wouldn't have given us this command if he didn't believe we could do it. He believes you can do this. You know what's really crazy? I believe you can do it. I don't know if you can do it perfectly. I don't know that I can ever do it perfectly. I don't think any of us can do it perfectly, but doggone it, I'm going to try. We're going to try. That if we're going to believe this Jesus, if we're going to believe in what he did, we're going to try to love like he loves. Now notice something. He doesn't do it, he doesn't ask them to do it for their own glory. They are not going to be rock stars. They are not going to be superstars for loving the way he loves. He says, here's the reason you're going to do this. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my, my followers, my disciples, my students. People are going to know me because they know you. That's how this is going to work. If you do this, people are going to know me because they know you. That's what makes the faith irresistible. That people will come to know Jesus and be saved because of our love. Because that's why we love. We love so that people will get to know Jesus and in turn be saved. That's why we do this. Not for our glory, not for anything that we can gain from it. We're not going to become rock stars and superstars in the Christian world. This is not going to happen. It's not what it's about. It's about somebody else knowing that their eternity in heaven is secure. That whatever separated them from, from the Father in heaven has been cared for through the Son who bridged the gap and made eternity possible. That's what this is about. This is about that kind of love.